Hello, welcome. This is lecture 40 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. This channel is dedicated to explain my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. This is my book. You can find it on Amazon. Please follow the link below. We are still on Chapter 6, Hypocalcemia and Hypercalcemia. We continue in this lecture to discuss calcium homeostasis. What about renal calcium handling? In the kidneys, the proximal tubule reabsorbs 60 to 70 percent of filtered calcium. This reminds us of what happens with potassium, with sodium as well. The thick ascending loop of Henle reabsorbs 20 percent. The distal convolute tubule reabsorbs 10 percent, while the finally the collecting tubule reabsorbs 5 percent. Now remember, like I said when we talk about magnesium, the thick ascending limb reabsorbs 60 to 70 percent of magnesium. Magnesium is unique in that regard. Calcium is like with any other electrolytes, mostly reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Regulation of calcium excretion in the kidney occurs at the terminal nephron. So most of the reabsorption happens in the proximal tubule, but the final reabsorption, the fine tuning of the process happens in the last part, okay, in the terminal nephron. This is a schematic. Uh, as you can see, the PT, the proximal tubule, you have 60 to 70 percent reabsorption, the thick ascending limb 20 percent, the distal convoluted tubule 10 percent, and finally in the collecting duct you have 5 percent of the total absorption. Let's talk more about that. In the proximal tubule, most of the reabsorption is passive. So as you know, you have reabsorption of sodium and water and then other things follow, other things like calcium. So 85% is passive via the paracellular root. Like I mentioned many times before, whenever we mention paracellular root, it's usually passive, while transcellular root is active. It requires energy. It requires energy from ATP. Now, active transport via the apical membrane or transcellular reabsorption is responsible for the remaining 15%. How is that enhanced? It is enhanced by calcitonin and the parathyroid hormone. Calcitonin comes from the thyroid. Now in the thick ascending limb also we have paracellular or passive reabsorption and transcellular or active reabsorption but again it's mostly paracellular like in the proximal tubule. Now this reabsorption via the transcellular route is also enhanced by the parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. So you can see absolute similarities between the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb. Now, Claudine 16 interacts with Claudine 19, and both are tight junction proteins, and they form a tight junction complex. This tight junction complex is cation selective and it enables not only paracellular calcium reabsorption but also magnesium reabsorption in the thick ascending limb. Now Claudine 14 on the other hand blocks this paracellular calcium reabsorption in the thick ascending limb and that happens when you have increased calcium level because in that case you don't want to reabsorb too much calcium. Now this this is the same diagram I showed when we talked about magnesium because Claudine 16 and 19 form this tight junction complex through which calcium and magnesium go through. Through what? The paracellular route. Now, Claudine 14 acts against that. Now, this process is passive and it depends on other things. What other things? The sodium and potassium uptake via the sodium potassium to chloride pump that generate uh, the mechanism required for the active uh, for the uh, passive reabsorption of calcium and also magnesium. ROMK, like we said many many times before, is the renal outer medullary potassium channel. So this diagram applies to both calcium and magnesium. 
Let's talk more about that. Now, the distal convoluted tubule here, like we said in the final segment of the nephron, in the dis distal convoluted tubule, in the collecting tubule, although you don't have a lot of the absorption, it's less than 10%, you have fine tuning of the whole process. And to do fine tuning, you need transcellular root, you need active reabsorption. So calcium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule is entirely active as opposed to the proximal and the thick ascending limb. It is via the transcellular root and occurs via the trip V5 channels. Okay, where did we hear that name before? Well, we heard it in the GI tract. We, we said that the reabsorption of calcium in the GI tract happens via the trip V5 and trip V6 channels, while we said uh, for magnesium, it's trip M6 and trip M7. Hormonal regulation of calcium and phosphate are tightly linked, okay? Like I said many times before, whenever you think about calcium, think about phosphate and magnesium. Uh, these three things are connected. Now, for calcium and phosphate, we have hormonal systems. We don't have that for magnesium. Now, for phosphate, and, and this is just I'm giving you a taste of it. We're going to discuss that in detail when we uh, are in, uh, in the chapter about phosphate. Phosphate homeostasis is regulated also by PTH, also by calcitriol, but we have here a new player, fibroblast growth factor 23, FGF23. Never forget FGF23. Very, very important. Um, and the FGF uh, clothoreceptor complex, more on that in future lectures. FGF23, where does it come from? Well, it comes from the bone. When phosphate goes up, it goes up, and it results in phosphaturia, it decreases calcitriol, and therefore you have a decrease in intestinal phosphate and calcium reabsorption through the intestine. Now, increased PTH secretion also leads to phosphaturia. So, PTH and FGF23 both are phosphaturic, but calcitriol, they have an opposite effect on calcitriol. PTH increases renal production of calcitriol, while FGF23 decreases it. If uh, you are going to take a test, please pay attention, okay? These things really come up on, on tests. So, again, PTH has a positive effect on calcitriol. It increases the production of calcitriol, the activation of alpha hydroxylase in the kidney, while FGF23 decreases calcitriol renal production. Now, both are phosphaturic. Okay, both are phosphatoric. PTH also preserves calcium. So PTH preserves calcium and waste what? Phosphate. So when you have, say, hyperparathyroidism, you have increased PTH, you're going to have hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. Makes sense. Okay, let's talk a little bit about parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is the main regulator of renal calcium reabsorption. In previous lectures, I said... The key to understanding sodium physiology is to know one thing. What was that? The antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin. Okay, when we talked about potassium, I said the key thing is what? Aldosterone. Here, when we talk about calcium, the key thing is to understand PTH. Okay, so when we have a decrease in serum ionized calcium, which is the definition of hypocalcemia, you inactivate the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland. When it is inactivated, you are going to stimulate PTH secretion. Now, PTH is going to enhance, enhance renal production of calcitriol. Both are going to increase renal reabsorption in the distal cambial tubule, which is an active process. It's via the transcellular route, like we just said. PTH also stimulates bone resorption by the osteoclast and increases secretion of calcitriol and both enhance intestinal calcium and phosphate reabsorption. So what's happening here? You have low calcium, you inactivate the calcium sensing receptor, PTH goes up, calcitriol will go up, and you are going to have increased reabsorption through the intestine, increased release of calcium from the bone and also enhanced reabsorption of calcium renally. So what's going to happen to the calcium is going to be restored. And I mentioned that in the previous lecture, and I will say it again. You really have to get a good grasp on this pathophysiology. Now, conversely, when you have hypercalcemia, you are going to activate the calcium sensing receptor. When that happens, you are going to decrease PTH secretion 
then you are not going to have that effect on the bone. You are not going to have reabsorption increase in the kidneys. You are going to have a decrease in calcitriol and therefore decrease in reabsorption through the intestine. So by acting on the intestine, on the kidneys, and on the bones, you are going to have a decrease in release of calcium, absorption of calcium, and then restoration of calcium towards normal. So exactly the opposite effect. Therefore, we can conclude that the function of the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid glands is to change PTH secretion depending on serum ionized calcium level. Okay, so calcium goes up and down, the calcium sensing receptor respond by either increasing the secretion of PTH or decreasing it, and PTH takes over from that, from there. Okay, let's talk for a second about vitamin D. How do you get vitamin D? Well, by exposure to sunlight. It has to be direct sunlight. You cannot be uh, sitting uh, behind a glass window. You need UV light. So the UVB light from the sun acts on the skin and you form vitamin D, or you can get it from dietary sources. Dietary sources can be vegetarian sources, and this is vitamin D2, or it can be fish, meat, animal sources, and this is vitamin D3. Regardless, these vitamin D precursors, whether it's coming from the skin through UVB, whether it's coming from vegetarian sources or animal sources, all that vitamin D, these precursors will have to go through the liver. Now, the liver is going to put 25 hydroxy, and we are going to end up with 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. Then, it's going to go to the kidney, and we are going to have another hydroxy group, and we are going to end up with 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, and this is calcitriol. So the most active form of vitamin D is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, and this is calcitriol. What does it do? It increases absorption of calcium, it preserves calcium renally, it increases the effect of uh, a vitamin D on the bone, so you have release of calcium from the bone, and this way you maintain uh, a calcium balance. So this is kind of a summary of uh, vitamin D. Again, calcitriol 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3 is the most active form of vitamin D, and it's produced by the tubular renal cells. How is that? You get 25-hydroxy vitamin D from the liver, and you convert it in the kidney uh, to calcitriol by 1-alpha-hydroxylase. So needless to say, if you have renal failure, you are not going to have enough calcitriol. Now, <clears throat> calcitriol enhances intestinal calcium and phosphate absorption and enhances renal absorption in the distal convolute tubule, which is an active process. This is again a schematic showing we have uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. This comes from the liver and in the kidneys via the effect of 1 alpha hydroxylase, you have 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the same as saying uh, calcitriol. And this reaction is enhanced, is stimulated by uh, PTH. If you have low calcium or low phosphate, also it's going to stimulate this conversion to 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D. Incidentally, estrogen and prolactin also have a positive effect. I'm going to end uh, here, and in the next lecture, we are going to finish our discussion on calcium homeostasis, and we are going to start talking about hypocalcemia. See you then.